Okay, let's bring that volume down there. <clears throat> we ready to make another painting? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski, and welcome to my studio. Today, we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists, and it's also a portrait of one of my favorite authors. Today, we're going to be looking at Fyodor Moller's portrait of Nikolai Gogol from 1841, and... Uh, Moeller did many portraits of Gogol. They were good friends, and but this is I like this one. We're going to take a look at some of the other ones, and um, I'm excited to do this one because I'm a, especially a huge fan of Gogol as as an author. So we'll talk a little bit about both of these great masters, one in uh, painting, one in literature, and how they be how they uh, intersected. Um, so. Let's just sort of look at the plan for today's episode. What we're going to do is we're going to start by getting this image on the canvas. We're going to do an image transfer. I'll show you how to get this image there. Uh, we'll stain it with a little bit of color, then, and we'll talk about the different colors that I'm using for, it, for this. We'll talk about the biographies of both um, uh, painter and author. And um, as briefly as I can, I'll try to keep it short. Then we'll uh, we'll do a little bit of an underpainting and background foreground, background foreground. It's pro this is going to be a little bit of a longer one. It won't surprise me if I'm here for about four hours painting away. Um, so if you're watching this episode after it was recorded, you can just jump right to the very end and take a look at how it turned out and decide for yourself if this is a lesson you want to learn and if I know what I'm talking about or not. I mean, who knows, right? <laughs> I think I know what I'm talking about, but um, of course, uh, like this video. Do it right now if you're watching. Subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. I'm not usually making a painting on a Sunday afternoon as I am today, um, but because this is significant, um, or tomorrow is a significant day in the life of Gogol. Uh, I thought um, I would squeeze an extra little episode in here. Um, of course, if you want to support the channel, as many of you have with a small donation, uh, 25 cents, a dollar through PayPal, if everybody did that, all 20,000 plus subscribers, wow, this would be, I could just do this full time instead of once a week here and there, right? Um, and you can use the super chat function within YouTube and donate money through it's YouTube takes like 40% of your donation. So if you want to ensure I get the most of your donation, probably an e-transfer is your best bet. And you can use my email, which is on my website. Uh, the link is in the description below. And you can also contact me through the Facebook group, which by the way, if you've never, um, heard of our Facebook group, join it right now there's the link is i think it's might be the first link in the description below awesome super supportive community of people just like yourself you can post your artwork take a photograph post it and then once a month i think this time next sunday we'll be doing our first feedback episode in a while i know i'm a little bit behind people are always contacting me asking about that so we're going to try and take care of that next week there's just so much work. There's so many of you who've joined the channel recently, which is all good things. It's a first world problem for sure. It's not a problem. It's it's a it's a celebration, right? So um, let's uh, let's take a look at our first step. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get an image on the canvas. Now we could sketch this out and. If you want to learn how to draw faces, you could take my drawing course, which is free here on YouTube. Um, I think there's a link in the description. Yes, there is a link in the description below for that. Um, so the way to get that onto your image is there's a Dropbox folder. And in that Dropbox folder, and the link is one of the first things in the description below, you'll see at the very top are resources for our first few set of paintings. Um, like learning how to do the color wheel, etc., and art supplies. Then you'll see there's another like 60 so folders here that begin with letters. And then you're going to see a whole bunch of folders that begin with numbers. Uh, the kind of the difference is the ones at the top here that begin with letters are a little easier. Uh, and then the ones further down are a little bit more complicated. And you can see where are we? We're at 152 here. 
So go all the way to the bottom. Some of these folders have three, four, five different paintings in them, as you probably know, if you've been with me for a while. So here we go all the way to the very bottom. And I put this down here because this is a, maybe a little bit more complex. Anytime we're doing faces in a more traditional academic fashion, it takes a little bit of time. So you're going to see that there is the original version of today's painting and the outline that I did on my iPad Pro using the Pro or yes, the Procreate app. And I'll also let you know I included there's a PDF here um, that is basically just the, the outline from a James Gurney uh, blog. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you that here in a little bit. Here's the actual original page. But this is just kind of, a, I think, an interesting little guide for um, the what he calls the color zones of the face. And maybe, a, you know, well, let's let's talk about that when we get there. <laughs> um, where sh let's leave that there. Okay, so let's get our image onto the, on here. So what I did is I just downloaded this image and printed it out on my inkjet printer at home. And then I'm going to transfer it onto this 9 by 12 size canvas board. All right. The other thing, too, is you might see there's a little bit of, of white paint. That's actually gesso. Gesso is um, basically paint, clear paint with um, plaster dust in it. And, and artists have been using it for generations and generations as a way of of uh, filling in the weave of the canvas to stabilize that surface. And then, uh, and then you can sand it down. So I, I put another coat, you know, it comes, it looks white and they, they say it's pre-gessoed. I like to add another layer of gesso and then sand it. And then I've got a very smooth surface and it makes doing this type of thing so much easier. So, once I've got that taped down, I'm going to use some carbon transfer paper. Actually, technically, this is graphite transfer paper that I put in the carbon transfer paper folder just because I ran out of that. Now, you'll see that I can use this over and over again, and it doesn't matter. Carbon transfer paper does the exact same thing as graphite tra transfer paper. They are different things, technically, but they do literally the exact same thing. So... Um, I see a bunch of familiar faces there in the chat. That's awesome. There's Nikki and Kathy and Pascaline. Awesome. Um, I know not everyone who's usually watching on a Tuesday will be here, but that's okay. You know, once the video is recorded, it's there forever and ever. People can catch up on episodes they missed. And probably not everyone is interested in painting this particular painting. Um, and that's okay too. You can certainly use the, you know, paint along, by, but by painting a different person while using these same techniques. Just gonna. I'm not doing all the lines in the hair and restraining myself from that because it's just gonna get painted over anyway. Okay. 
So, good idea before you take that tape off, just fold it up and make sure all the lines are in fact there. We aren't missing anything. I think I got it all. And then let's peel that off. So let's move on to our next step. So now that we, we've got our, our drawing on here, we could have sketched it out, but it's much faster obviously to do the image transfer. Let's stain it with a little bit of color. We're gonna use some, I'm gonna use some warm yellow. We could use a warm brown or red or purple or green or orange, whatever you want. Um, the warm yellow, though, is my own kind of version of the more traditional brown that artists have been using for a thousand plus years. Um, I just use this yellow because it, it's nice and quick and fast and we can get something on the canvas very quickly. We don't have to mix that color. Um, and as I've said many times, it's the difference is very minimal. There is a difference but it's um, almost imperceptible. Unless you're, you've got the two paintings side by side, you probably would be hard pressed to spot the difference if you didn't tell someone what, the, what was different about these two paintings. Um, I'm not sure we're going to use cool red, so I'm just going to keep this fella to the side. If I need it, I'll use it. Okay. So, um, let's just talk about the colors that I just put there on the palette. So, I'm going to use this brand, this Amsterdam paint. Um, it's considered a student grade. A tube like this is about... 12 to 15 dollars a tube for 250 milliliters um, and you're I'm a, I, that yellow that I'm about to use for my imprimatur is this the azo yellow deep now if you want something a little bit less expensive you could use or more expensive sorry but a little more more professional quality you can use golden now this here is basically the, the exact same paint this is my cadmium yellow dark and this tube here is as I said, twelve to fifteen. This is thirty to forty dollars. I think maybe some, maybe a little bit less, maybe twenty five or so. So it's and it's half the size for at least double the price. Now it is has a higher concentration of pigment, but if you're just starting out, there's no reason to, to spend a lot of on art supplies. No reason whatsoever. In fact, it can can make people more afraid of experimenting because they feel like, oh, I'm spending all this material and if it doesn't turn out, wow, what a failure. So I think it's best to start out with the least amount of stakes possible. Here's Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, Chromacolor, and not Museum Color because there's a significant amount of of titanium white in all these colors that make it really difficult to, to mix a black as we will do and I'll show you how to do that. So um, basically what we're, we've got here is what we call a split primary palette where we've got two yellows, two blues, and two reds. Again, I didn't squeeze my cool red out here just because I don't think I'm going to need it for today's painting. But that's where it would go somewhere around here right um, and to make a black here's the instructions on how to do that now of course I'll talk about that when we get to that stage um, so let's stain this color or this painting with some color I'm gonna use my a little smaller palette here and I'm gonna put a little bit of water in you know maybe a mm, 60% water, 60% paint, 40% water around there. 
almost half and half. Obviously, the more water we put in there, the more diluted it will be, and the less of an effect this yellow will have. You don't need to do this. Uh, I love doing this, however. I think it makes a huge difference on a painting. But, you know, not I, I, certainly probably the majority of people today do not do this. I think that's... Um, I think it's a mistake to to at least, you know, um, not put, like to put something there, I think will radically improve your paintings, especially if you're a beginner. You know, the Impressionists were the first group of painters who did not do this. Um, for like a thousand years, artists did this. The Impressionists were sort of rebels in every sense, and they were like, yeah, we're not going to do what our fathers generation of painters did and if this is what they do we're not going to do that you know and um, so you could if you still think of the impressionists as revolutionary artists you could follow in their revolutionary footsteps you know there's certainly um, you know the, the, there's a case to be made for for not doing this I think Personally, the, the case is stronger to do a little bit of a stain to get started. Okay, so I'm just going to wipe my brush. Get all that excess paint off. And there's Rip-X with a couple of uh, fingers saluting. Um... Nice to see you in the chat. I love seeing different people popping in to say hello. Let's kick this with, kick this? <laughs> Hit this with a little bit of hot air, blow dry it, just so we can move on to the next step here a little bit faster. So I'm gonna mute the. Okay, so we'll let this sit here for a little bit, and while that's sitting there, let's talk about um, our, our artist and author today. So, um, let's start out here talking about Fyodor Moller. Um, so, Moller, born in 1812 and dies in 1874 at age 62. 1874 also happens to be, I'm pretty sure, the, the first year of the first uh, Impressionist exhibition. So just give you an idea of the era that he finds himself in, in this sort of um, more academic tradition that was dominant for 500 plus years and is about to kind of come to an end that that also kind of coincides with the 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 beginnings of the industrial revolution and this approach to painting was, was essentially unchanged for 500 years there's little bits of each region each school would have maybe slightly different approaches to, to color theory and to um you know things like the imprimatura, what color precisely you would use, what colors you would use for skin tones, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that is just about to be challenged right at the end of his life. Um, so, um, Moeller is born in St. Petersburg, Russia. I thought I would just sort of um, help people visualize where that is. So, St. Petersburg, 
right up in, the, in northern uh, Russia, uh, near the borders of Estonia and Finland. Right in St. Petersburg, used to be called Stalingrad and Leningrad, and um, during the Soviet era. Um, so his father was a naval officer and eventually became secretary of the navy. So he comes from like a fairly powerful, wealthy family. Um, when he was young, he en enrolled in the as a navy cadet, um, and and um, you know learned you know how to sail and all that, all, all of the the things that a young boy does as a cadet. And he later served in the military himself. Um, he uh, during well, during his time as a soldier, so he's um, he he serves in the in the Russian army during um, uh, the the Polish November uprising. So there's these as uh, Russia has had imperial ambitions for a long time. Um, one of those was to put down um, a, a revolution in Poland when Poland, um, who's been kind of an adversary of Russia for a long time, an adversary and a conquered people. Um, he serves in the military and is is wounded. Wha oh, why is this not on camera? Ah, sorry. Um, thank you so much, Pascaline. So while, um, while, he's, while he's convalescing, uh, he, he's given some drawing tools, which is not unusual. There's, it's kind of almost like a tradition amongst soldiers to kind of keep them busy, is to give them some books, try to get them to, so that they're not just wallowing in their pain while they're recovering from their injuries. You know, sometimes they have horrible um, disfigurement and loss of limbs and, and a way to kind of keep them, their spirits up. Often soldiers are given you know, uh, supplies to write, to journal, to draw, and classes like that. You know, sometimes exercise classes and, and sports, etc. So he really learns to draw and paint for the very first time when he's recovering as a soldier. And during this time, he also starts taking classes with Karl, Karl Brulioff, who is like a also a very well known and um, really important Russian painter um, during this time, um, and because of so he's he's like he really kind of quickly catches on, and during this time when he catches on, he he starts making these large battle scenes, and he starts winning some awards for this. So in a span of just like you know ten years, he goes from being um, you know, uh, you know, just another soldier who's wounded in the war, to somebody who's like starting to win awards amongst artists who've been painting for you know since they were kids, since the same age that he was when he started in the in the navy. Um, and so eventually, once he's 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 become successful enough, he he resigns from the army and dedicates himself full time to painting. He does study for a period of time in Italy um, and again gains more and more skills, comes back to St. Petersburg. When he comes back to St. Petersburg, uh, he meets Nikolai Gogol. And Nikolai Gogol, um, who we'll talk about shortly here, the, the great author and the subject of today's painting, um, the two of them become very close friends and they spend a lot of time together and Gogol includes people who may or may not be like Moeller in his stories, um, as well as obviously uh, Moeller makes many, many portraits of Gogol. We'll, we'll look at this here in a, in a while. Um, let's see. Uh, he also does a whole bunch of murals and things that are um, in the Kremlin. So you can see that he's, he becomes, you know, a very, very important and powerful artist over the, the span of his relatively short life, you know, so he's 62 when he passes away, but when we really think about it, it's only like the last 30 or so years of his life where he's really practicing art um, in, in a really meaningful full-time way. I think great irony here is that on his, his last painting that he's making, or that he made, was the a crucifixion 
uh, a, a fresco in in um, on on the the wall of a church in a, in a very small little village. And while he's working on that painting, he he succumbs, he dies, he get catches pneumonia and dies. And you know, I don't know. There's for me, there's just like an irony of he's making this portrait of Jesus on the cross, and he himself um, gets sick and dies. Uh, so far, I've, I haven't heard of any resurrection stories, <laughs> however, um, related to that. Let's see. Um, we'll just take a quick look at some of his other paintings. I, I mean, for a guy that... Um, you know, was mostly self-taught at the early part of his career, it is pretty amazing how much, how well he was able to kind of catch on to the point where he was able to start winning awards that helped him to really study academic, to go to basically art school, right? Um, like, that's beautiful. What a beautiful painting. She's kind of got her hands in the same sort of position as the, as the Mona Lisa. We saw that one earlier. That's a great painting. This boy in a navy uniform. That's great. I love that. This isn't his final painting, but you can see it's Jesus carrying the cross. That painting. Should... Okay, so here's one of, of the portraits of Gogol. Not the painting version we're going to do today. Uh, some close ups. Okay, I do want to show, so here's just a whole bunch, I think he, he did maybe a dozen or more portraits of Gogol. There was, I had at one point found a, a, a website, of course I can't find it now, of, that sort of shows all the different portraits that he did of Gogol. Um, and it is, it's kind of neat seeing the same person painted over and over and over again. Um, Yeah, I think that's... So let's just kind of quickly turn our attention to just a, a short kind of biography on Gogol himself. Uh, Nikolai Gogol, born in 1809 and dies in 1852, you know, at a fairly young age, right? So he's age 42 when he passes away. And um, during this time, Gogol is, is, creates some of the, the greatest stories uh, of, of all time. I mean, uh, Gogol is, um, you know, a couple of his probably most famous books would be the would be Dead Souls, is is his probably his most famous novel. Um, Terrace Bulba is also a, a well known book, maybe not nearly as famous, and he's also probably even more well known as an author of uh, short stories, as one of, probably arguably the the greatest if not in the top five greatest short story authors of all time you know probably you know along the you know maybe kafka hemingway would be two off the top of my head um of great short story writers i can't i think i'm drawing a blank on a few other ones but this is I've I own this book this version of it and I've I've read um, I've read every story in here. I really like this uh, Richard Pervier and Larissa Vola Hunk, Vol, Volokonsky um, as the translators for his work. I think they've I've looked I've I've spent a little bit of time doing a little bit of research um, and there and and looking at different translations of work by Nikolai Gogol, by uh, these they, these two also did translations of Dostoevsky and um, a number of other, uh, like, uh, who else did they, Tolstoy, I think they did a, a bunch of Tolstoy as well. Anyway, um, I, they, they just have a great way of, of, of making the, the, these texts, which are written, you know, almost 200 years ago, feel very alive and very fresh. So I would I would recommend if you're thinking about 
um, diving into the, the work of Nikolai Gogol is to consider the Pervier Volonovsky um, translations. Here's just another link to just a few other here again, uh, Dead Oh, that's the Tales, uh, which is also translated by Pervier as well. The Dead Souls, where's Dead Souls? Um, well, let's just kind of take a quick little. It is um, Gogol is kind of an interesting fellow because Gogol is born in Ukraine, and let's just take a look at exactly where in this this tiny little like town, which I, I think is is even smaller today than it ever was, kind of in the in the middle of Ukraine. You know, it's um, near Kiev and the Dnieper and sort of. Maybe I guess closer to Kharkiv in the in the Russian border there. Um, all of this was at one point occupied by Russia just a few months ago, and since has been won back by Ukrainian soldiers over the course of a little of the in the I think was it the uh, September offensive counteroffensive of 2022, and um, so grows up in a small town, a little village, and he's surrounded by this, these, um, a lot of like folk tales that, that, uh, the local peasants would tell, you know, late at night after working. And that made a huge influence on him as a little boy. Um, you know, it, it He's born in this Ukrainian Cossack town, and we've we've. I'm not even going to go into the history of Ukraine and and Cossacks and etc. Um, but um, um, you know, he his father was a soldier, so um, he's kind of immersed in in the the folk tales and the and these tales of heroism, um, of you know of military life, not too dissimilar from. Uh, Moeller, the, the the author, the painter of today's portrait of Gogol, also having been raised in a military family, in, in his case, in the Navy, right? Um, so his father passes away when he's 15 years old, and, you know, he ends up, um, uh, I think in some ways that was very quite liberating for him. He really starts writing some poetry. He publishes his poetry in kind of a, a left-leaning Ukrainian revolutionary magazine at the time. Um, and uh, one of the things that happens is he publishes it in the, and it's just, it's shredded and torn apart by like the, by any, all these different critics to the point where he goes and he buys up all of the, the magazines that, that, uh, he could find and then destroys them because he's so embarrassed about his his poor poetry. Um, another thing is he was a little bit shorter of a fellow, so when he goes to school, um, uh, he is no he has very few friends and people call him the mysterious dwarf. Um, so I think again that we're leading up to the kind of stories that he he writes, but he's he finds himself to be kind of a bit of a loner and not um, uh, yeah not a particularly popular kid in school, and I think that lends to him this very dark, um, very very like a very dark humor in his work and. Gogol is often seen as like really the uh, the a proto surrealist and or like really one of the like the grandfather of surrealism. Um, I'll I'll talk about a couple of my favorite stories, very short stories by him, and the impact that they had on on literature as a whole. Um, let's just see. So, um, at one point in his life, he eventually moves to. Um, St. Petersburg, so 1834, so how old is 1834, he is uh, like 23 years old, so he's 20, in his early 20s, he, he leaves his, his um, he leaves Ukraine and goes to northern Russia, um, where he also studies there as well, and it's interesting because while he's away, he becomes really fascinated with Ukrainian 
folklore, Ukrainian history, um, which is not unusual. I think anyone who's spent any time traveling and living abroad, the longer you're abroad, the more you become fascinated with home. And the more... So he starts doing... He, he actually... Um, uh, you know, where is it? He... There's a great... I think it's in, in the Wikipedia page. Um... Like basically at this time, it's when he goes to Russia. I don't know if it's in here, but he starts writing stories that he remembers in his own sort of uh, embellishments of, of stories based on Ukrainian folklore, and those actually become quite popular. These these because in some ways he's some one of the first persons to kind of write some of these stories down. You know, each time somebody tells one of these stories. They're, they're kind of a little bit of a distortion of the original. So by the time he's writing them down, they they're become fully his own, really. Um, but they become very popular, not only in Ukraine, but in Russia as well. Um, Ukraine literally translates uh, into means borderlands. And so Ukraine, uh, just as a quick little history, you know, Ukraine is... For the most part, this big flat expanse. You know, it's a lot like Saskatchewan or North Dakota. And because of that, you know, except really on the edges of the country where there might be a little bit of mountains or there, there's like the Black Sea, there it's a very hard place to defend, as Ukraine is encountering right now. Uh, during this invasion the, uh, by Russia, is it's a, it's a hard country. There's not, it's not like there's a lot of mountains you can hide behind, like the Americans found in Afghanistan, right? It's um, you have a lot these big open spaces, and so because of that, Ukraine has historically been invaded by Russia a dozen or so times, by Poland a number of times, by Vikings from the north by Persians from the south, by Greeks from the south west. So Ukraine has always been fought over by all these different people. And um, I think both Polish people and Russian people, um, especially, have always sort of seen Ukraine as, as um, this, as like this border space. But also because it's been constantly attacked is kind of a, a, a country that has had a hard time um, uh, uh, achieving maybe its potential. Like because every time they've gotten anywhere, they've been attacked and ransacked, and kind of all the the history and 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 wealth is is taken away, extracted. So it's always been, you know, kind of a, a place where you have a fairly hardy groups of people like Cossacks who inhabit that space. And, um, you know, Russians traditionally, and, and um, I don't think it's speaking out of order to say, have kind of looked down on Ukrainians as sort of like a very peasant people, like a hardworking but kind of peasant people that who've been exploited for a long time and so there's a certain kind of endearing quality to Ukrainians that Russians might have as sort of like little brother I think is you know I think a lot of Russians look at Ukraine as sort of like the little kid in the family kind of thing Ukrainians don't quite see Russians in the same sort of way as I think Russia has, in, has found out but um uh um, suffice to say that, again, Russians, I think, found, you know, it's very quaint. Like, um, I think in, I'm just off the top of my head, you know, it's sort of maybe like the way Canadians, Western Canadians, Ontarioans um, might look at Newfoundland, for instance, as sort of like a bunch of, you know, the, the, these backwards fishermen kind of thing and, and make, you know, it's a very famous, they're long-standing tradition of jokes about, you know, Newfie jokes, as we call them in Canada. And I'm not saying, I have some of my best friends are originally from Newfoundland. Um, uh, my, my closest friend, but the best man at my wedding, his family comes from Newfoundland. Um, so uh, I think, you know, but again, yeah. So anyway, long story short, uh, while uh, Gogol goes to Russia, he also starts writing stories 
in Russian for a Russian audience. Some might say his Ukrainian stories are also for a Russian audience. Russia being the much larger dominant culture at this particular time, um, where if you were Ukrainian, Ukrainian and Russian are similar languages, not the same, but they're very similar, that you could kind of you can get around. And, and a lot of Ukrainians would also learn Russian in the same way that a lot of Canadians learn English and a little bit of French so that they can communicate in both languages. Um, his stories... So maybe it's just... It's worth just... Sort of, I want to just kind of point out two famous stories by Gogol that I love and that are... I don't know, maybe 10 pages long. I'm sure you could find them online and read them entirely within 20 minutes and have a pretty good idea who Gogol is as an author. Um, the Overcoat is a very famous short story by Gogol. Um, that, um, it, it's about this guy who's got this shabby jacket and he's people are always making fun of him at work and he eventually saves his money and buys a much nicer jacket that it, and he's beaten up and his jacket is stolen and um, he then turns into a ghost and starts haunting people um, in a, kind of an effort to get his jacket back and I think already that starts to you start to kind of like oh a, a ghost the, this character like after he dies the story doesn't end it just keeps on going now he's a ghost that is haunting people about the jacket and um and it's it's quite funny it's it's strange it's, it's strange to read a story that's written in you know the like 1840 uh and yet it's like wow this is I feel like I've you could watch something like this on Netflix right now and it wouldn't feel out of place at all. Um, another great story, this is probably my favorite of Gogol's work, Diary of a Madman, is laugh out loud hilarious. It's uh, literally it, like intended to be like a journal of this guy who's losing his mind and... Um, I'm trying to remember the whole story. Like, oh, they've, here they've literally got the different dates. It's about this guy who works... Uh, I'm not sure what kind of office he works in. And um, he... I think he's, he sort of falls in love with maybe the the daughter of the director. Of basically his boss's daughter. And he sort of becomes obsessed with her. And he he's kind of wants to, you know, impress her. Kind of follows her around a little bit. Um, and he, so it starts off kind of normal. And then as the story progresses, and again, it's only like 15 pages long, his thinking starts to get weirder and weirder to the point where he imagines himself to be, uh, like the king, the king of, of Italy or something. And... Um, he he sort of stops going to work or gets fired or he shows up to work. He starts imagine he imagines himself as being the king who's sort of like kind of undercover, and um, he he tries to kind of get um, uh, meetings with the you know with all of these important people, and they keep getting rejected. Uh, he keeps getting rejected. And he just sort of figures, oh, well, maybe they're they're doing that deliberately because they don't want to be seen as giving favors to the king. So oh, I, I don't want to... Uh, I, I really appreciate their, their treating me just like a regular guy and, and not trying to, you know, impress me with, like, by, by kissing my butt or anything. And so it's really funny because eventually he gets, like, thrown in jail and beat up by the police. And he's... Be and at no time does he think like, oh, you know, and they're yelling at him like, you're a fake and a phony. What? You're you're crazy and you're, you're dressed up like a homeless man. And instead, he's just like, he's like, you know, it's very interesting how they treat royalty in this country. Like, I mean, for them to beat me up and throw me in jail. I mean, I guess I guess they must just figure, you know, um, they really want to show me how the justice system works here. And, I mean, it's just, it's, it's hilarious. Um, it's, it's, uh, but what's revolutionary about Gogol's whole approach is just writing, 
you know, from the perspective of a quote unquote madman, right? Like no one had written anything like this before, right? I mean, the idea of trying to write a story from the perspective of of a crazy person, a person who's who's losing their grip on reality was sort of strange. I mean, we could say potentially like Cervant, um, who wrote Don Quixote, you know, maybe a couple hundred years before this, um, obviously was writing about someone who also had some delusions. So he's not really the, f the first, but um, this is certainly unusual. So we would consider Gogol to be, you know, the really one of the first authors to write about the grotesque, about the fantastic, um, and surrealism, really. You know, he's, he's really blazing new trails. And, and, you know, like there's, I think there's a list of, of authors whose work uh, was directly influenced by, um, by Gogol here. So you have like Dostoevsky, Kafka, um, Nabokov, Flannery O'Connor. Um, so, you know, pretty much anyone who's writing in like a, a, a style to this day that involves, you know, strange, surreal elements has a major debt to pay uh, to Gogol, who, who, for all intents and purposes, established the genre. And, and maybe arguably even the, the genre of short story as well, or really kind of um, um, pushed it forward. Um, okay, so let's, uh, I want to move on here because I'm just talking away. Let's, uh, let's get to work on today's painting. So now that this is nice and dry, let's start, um, I think it'd probably be beneficial for us to do a little bit of underpainting. And we've talked about this many times. There's lots of different um, contested definitions of what underpainting can be. Even myself, I've sort of, you know, gone back and forth here. I think the way that I see it, you know, there are some people whose idea of an underpainting might be not to put an imprimatur at all, but to kind of mix a kind of a brown and to paint that brown, you know, around some of these lines, um, maybe not even have any drawing lines at all, and then just sort of dilute it and then paint that into the background, right? So use the imprimatur and your underpainting as like one step. I, I, I sort of now see underpainting as a little bit of like, establishing some of the the most important features that we might be a little bit afraid of of, of destroying while we paint because we might uh, cover them up and and especially I find when we're painting portraits this can be handy so I'm going to take my um, cool blue and my cool yellow mix a green here basically we're going to kind of mix a black I'm not too concerned about get doing the best job of a perfect black, because I just want something kind of dark. But essentially, this is how you make a black. We've taken cool yellow, cool blue, and made it a green, and then the opposite color to that on the color wheel is, is red or warm red. We add that to it, and it basically neutralizes that color. This is a little bit more on the purple side, so let's just, I was going to say, let's just go with it, but you know what, let's just make sure that people will just teach people a little bit on how to make a black. So we just, if it looks a little purple, what's the opposite of purple on the color wheel? Yellow. Add that to it and neutralizes the purple. The purple neutralizes the yellow and we've got black. We're probably going to mix that a few more times uh, throughout today's painting. So, um... So really, what I'm going to do here is just get some of the lines of the eyes.
we could do this with a purple or blue rather than mixing a black i just mixed the black i mean it is darker than anything else so that does help make it stand out because we're going to paint colors over top of of this do anything on this shirt here. His jacket does get really dark, so maybe... Okay, I think that's probably good enough. Well, maybe maybe I'll just quickly go around the outer edges of his face, maybe. Maybe I'll, I'm, just so I, I'm going to quickly also go around the edge of his hair. Because that's where we're going to, we're going to paint the background in next. And so if, that might just help ensure that I don't lose track of that. Okay. Cool. Just gonna clean my brushes. Oh, and there's Rick there as well. Rick's been active on the Facebook group too, posting some pretty cool content. Doing some research on other artists that he likes, so always excited that to see people getting excited about artists that they are interested in and sharing that information. Okay, let's... Actually, I'm just gonna quickly blow dry this here. <clears throat> One thing you notice, like as I'm blow drying, you know, I'm also just kind of smudging this out. That helps get rid of maybe any big ridges or texture. Um, because I'm about to paint this blue here, and if I've got some dark colors, 
it might sort of mix into that and then smudges and then I'm, I'm trying to paint those dark layers out so it doesn't hurt to just do a little bit of that because the paint will dry faster when um, when it's thinner okay now let's uh, let's paint the background to today's painting and that background is got um, is this kind of a blue sky in behind here. Now, if you for your painting, you could use a blue sky. You could change the color of the sky. Do whatever you 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 like. I'm gonna kind of keep this sky. We'll do a version thereof. Um, it's you know there's a little bit of this fade going from uh, light from around his shoulders to dark above his head. Um, which somehow seems maybe a little bit appropriate for the kind of work the that Gogol was writing about. These kind of darker stories of often involving ghosts and haunting um, that are, you know, scary, but like dark comedy. Like just last night I was watching Cocaine Bear on, I don't know if you've seen this ridiculous movie about a bear that that find some cocaine in the forest that some drug smugglers have dropped there and it's it's absolutely ridiculously stupid absolutely stupid but it's also kind of funny and you know you could do worse things than watch that movie it's probably it's certainly not going to win an academy award or or be written about as more than than a lame uh, way of passing an hour and a half but um, that kind of dark comedy is you know, again, maybe you could say Servant was the first one, but Gogol is definitely the, you know, one of the early masters of it, let's say. Anyway, how should we approach this? There's a few different ways we could do this with glazing. We could try to do it much faster. Um, let's... Um, Let's do this maybe a little bit more quickly, just so because sometimes you know I just like to spend some time in these areas. Uh, I'm going to take my cool blue, and I'm just going to kind of quickly paint it in here. And now I'm going to take some white. And maybe I'll just even put this white in here. So blending that up as quickly as I can.
So I'm, I have to kind of do this with a, a, a lot of paint. If you try to do this too thin, it gets, gets harder to do. Looks pretty good for, on my side. When I look at the camera, it's like, oh, that looks, I can see, not quite as even as I might like. Okay, I think that's pretty good. I'm going to blow dry it and maybe do a little tinkering to it. Well, let's just see how it turns out. Okay, so I'm just going to go back and add a little bit more of this blue. There's a bit of white still in my brush coming out. fluid here. So I just took a little bit of glazing fluid and just the remaining paint on my brush here. This makes this paint way more transparent. That way Down. 
adding a bit of white into this mixture. Let's just see how that looks, and then I'm, I might... Ah. Okay, you know, it does look a little bit lighter up there. I might have had a little bit more white on my brush when I went back up there. Um, I think I'm fine with this right now. I, you know, I hesitate to do any more stuff in that area because it's, I, you know, I put a fairly thick amount of paint on here when I was doing this. And that paint takes a while to dry. And as it dries, it can sometimes look darker or lighter than it ultimately ends up being so it might be just worth just letting this dry and who knows maybe that white area could just settle and just be fine so while we wait for that to settle we still got lots of other stuff to do so we'll move on from the background i mean ideally this would be as finished as we can get it if we're doing any kind of blending like that Oh, there's Lolly and Paula in the chat there. That's awesome. Let's go to... <laughs> so now that we've got some background in there, whether it's finished or not is irrelevant, let's move on to the foreground. And... I guess my question in my mind is, where should I start here? Should I go right to the face? Should I go to the jacket? I think um, I think what I might do is actually tackle a little bit of the the his jacket first so that I can get rid of some of this yellow we've got all this yellow on here and that's really gonna affect how I see the face and the hair and plus there's this paint is still kind of I blow dried it but it's probably not completely dry it's probably a little bit tacky so that just gives by me a little more time to allow this to to settle so while that's settling i can work on this and then once that's done i'll have less yellow that could confuse me when i'm trying to mix my skin tones here so and i think it'd also just be satisfying to have more of the painting done a little bit faster 
So let's take a look at his jacket and how we would want to go about this. Now, it looks, it's kind of hard to tell what color this jacket is. It looks maybe a little bit purpley, like a really deep purple. And then we've got this like really dark crimson collar and stuff underneath. Um, it does make a maybe a little bit more sense to do the collar inside here first and then put the jacket over top of it. So, uh, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to do this in two, two layers. So we'll do maybe a red and then a purple. And so let's, um, okay, so here's, I'm, I'm going to end up going to use my, I'm going to end up using my cool red after all. Remember I didn't squeeze this here because I didn't think I'd use it. Well, here I am using it after all. So... I think the way I'll go about this is I'm going to take my I'm just going to take my warm red right out of the tube and I'm going to paint this yeah I'm going to paint this right all over Obviously, the original has a different color here. Let's put them side by side. It's it's not going to be this warm red. When we're done. It's going to have way more nuance to it. But it won't hurt to have kind of a nice base layer of that red in place. Okay. Now, I'm going to take my cool red and my warm blue and mix this together and get a purple going. It's not going to be enough to cover everything, so let's just make more of it. I'm just lifting that up so that I can get a little bit of color on my edges. I, I like kind of getting some of that. Sometimes I like showing it, I like keeping it, and sometimes I like kind of hiding it a bit. How did he do this shoulder?
can see it's, it's a little bit lighter there because that's where the blue was. And that doesn't so much bother me at all. I'm going to put uh, purple in this area underneath his neck, up like this. Probably like a little scarf tucked into his shirt. Put that down into there. So what this does, even though we're going to paint a lot of paint, a darker color over top of this, is it just sort of grounds it in uh, um, so that color that if we paint, like, let's say, just a black right over top of this purple, it's not just going to be a black. We're going to have a bit of purple underneath. And it's going to be super subtle and nuanced, but that can be really, really nice and very satisfying for a viewer. Sometimes it's one of those things that you might only see under certain kind of lighting conditions. And... You know, when you see those kinds of things as a viewer, it just lets you feel like, oh, the artist spent a little bit of time here. And, and it's sort of, it's like an Easter egg in a movie, you know, like that little bit of thing that rewards somebody who spends a little bit more time looking at it. You know, it's those little details that I think elevate an average painting into something much more special. You know, where you think like, oh, whoa, this, this, the author or this painter, this poet, is just thinking a little bit more to try to, to, to give me, to reward me for, for my effort, right? So I'm going to blow dry this because now I want to go into the hair. Or you know what, I think I'm going to go into the face first. So I just want to make sure that my hands aren't going to be stamping all over my sweater isn't going to get any more paint on it than it already has.
Okay, so now you can see that now that this is no longer yellow, it's going to really help me dial in the colors of the face a little bit so I don't have to compete with all of this and try to just block that out and my brain is not big enough to be able to do that. I need to kind of simplify things for myself. You might be a genius who can do it all and if that's your, what your, how your, your brain works then by all means run with that. That sounds great. Um, but probably the majority of people have uh, similarly undersized brains like me. <laughs> okay, now let's go to the skin tone. Let's mix a skin tone. And, well, I'll keep it zoomed out for a moment here. Let's start with our um, warm yellow and a little bit of warm red, and let's mix this together. That's going to give us you now just a little bit more of an orange color. You can see I didn't put much red in there at all. all right. Now let's take some blue, my, my warm blue from over here. And now let's bring that into this. We don't need a lot. If we put too much, it's going to go kind of um, greenish, right? I want to keep this on the on a little bit more of the orangey side to the point where, well, let's see. Let's add some white to this now. Mix that down there. That's actually pretty close to a f to. Maybe like on his forehead there. So let's uh, let's zoom in on this painting. Just to see. Not bad. It is a little maybe on the yellow side, so let's just take a bit more white. That's close. I think what I want to do is I'm going to take this color and add just a little bit more red to it, just to give it a bit more um, warmth and color. You know, um, yeah, just a slight bit more pinkish quality. What I'm looking for is a color that's kind of in between, like it's probably in here. Where else would I see that? Maybe in and around here. So I'm going to just start by taking this paint. Just want to make sure I don't have any big ridges or anything here. Now you can see there is some of the paint that's from the previous layers coming through. I'm not too concerned about that because I think we're gonna, still going to build up more and more layers of paint and it's probably going to get covered in. Um, I could blow dry that and do another layer. In fact, maybe I will just because that... Well, you know, that's going to get darker. Yeah, let's do a little bit of quick blow dry, actually.
And let's I want to see these side by side. How far up does his hairline go? Okay, um, I think while I'm here, it's going to take a bit of white here. I'm just going to clean this brush. I'm gonna take a little bit of white and the paint that was on my brush. So it's not totally white, it's a little bit um, modified here. So and I'm gonna take that, I'm just gonna paint into these eyes. Well, how does it look? See that, this is not white, but when we put it on here, it's like, whoa, that is really white. That's like right out of the tube. And you're like, no, no, I, it's actually not nearly white at all. But it's color is relative when we're painting, right? It's color changes when it's depending on what's closer to it. Um, so that's okay for right now. And I've also, they're a little bit bigger. We're going to kind of maybe shape that and come back over and darken those pupils, or not the pupils, the eyeball itself. Well, and of course the pupils, we will, but... So, I think what would make sense now is to go in and paint the hair. So let's mix a um, a brown, a warm brown, and let's zoom back out a bit here. Uh, so let's take our cool, or sorry, warm yellow, warm red, and mix that together. We get like a, a really dark orange. Let's maybe. And some warm blue. So all three, warm yellow, warm red, warm blue. Mix this together. The more blue we put in here, the darker of a brown we're going to get. I don't think we want to go too dark, because he's got some lighter parts in his hair. And even that hair almost has a bit of a reddish, purpley quality in there. So maybe it... Um, yeah, we'll put a bit more red into this hair, and maybe a bit more blue in there. So I'm going to take, use a small brush for doing a little bit of outlining.
just going to just take a little bit more of this paint. Just cover up a few places where I could see that uh, paint kind of coming through from the background. I might have made his hair a little bit poofier than it originally was. That's okay. Okay, so now I'm just looking at the background. Do I want to do a little more in the background? I can see more than, than ever. Okay, so let's go to... Okay, so now we've got most of the painting started paint is starting to fill this canvas up we've really covered most of the the yellow that was there right our imprimatura so I think now I just want to go in and maybe just do a little bit of a touch up on the background here so I'm just going to take my cool blue which I had been using already and there was a few places there where it was a little bit spotty Right up top. Okay, let's blow dry that. I'm going to take a bit of glazing fluid. And just take my brush, get that glazing fluid in here. So what I was just doing is just softening up that edge where the, some of that white is starting to come up there. We'll see how it might be good enough. One of the things we could spend hours and hours tinkering with that. I think I think that might be good enough for my 
my uh, sensibility anyway. It does look, it's not, you know, it's, because it's still wet, I think there's a little bit more streakiness there than there might ordinarily be. Paula says, I'm scared that my figure will turn into a woman. Uh, it could look kind of feminine right now. I think once we do a little bit more work, though, I think it'll look sufficient, sufficiently masculine, especially once the mustache goes there. Um, I'm just going to use the... That's pretty good. Not perfect. I think that's still gonna needs to dry. I can see it's still a little bit shiny in that area. Okay. So I think once again, I'm gonna go back down to this jacket here. So now that we've got our background, I think let's say, let's just call it done. And let's go now back down to the jacket of Nikolai Gogol. And we'll darken this in. And um, that way, most of the rest, most of the painting will, will be complete. And then we can just spend the rest of the time on the face. I could understand some people finding that stressful because they're just like, well, what if I goof up on the face? I don't want to wait till the end to do that because... I'd much rather spend the next little bit working on the face, and then if the face turns out, then great, I'll finish the rest of the painting. I could see people doing that, for sure. Um, personally, I want to get this done. I think that will just make me, will make me feel better, because I feel relatively confident I can pull off the face. But, you know, how, approach the painting however you like. If you want to jump to the... A little bit later in the video after it's recorded and do the face and then come back and do the jacket with me go right ahead um so we have these side by side uh, what should we do first let's um Do this first. Maybe I'll do the color that and we'll end up mixing the same color we use for the rest of the painting anyway. So I think what I want to do first off is I'm going to mix more black. So I'm going to take my cool blue, take a lot more cool yellow, and let's just scoop a big and cool red in here. Okay, let's mix all that together. For the moment, it looks quite green or uh, brownish, right? And that tells me I've got a lot of red, and i got a lot of yellow. I need more cool blue, so let's bring in more of that cool blue into the mixture.
Okay, so now we got a black. Nice big helping of black too. Um, let's let's mix our purple again. You notice I didn't even clean my brush. I'm just gonna go right in here because we want it kind of dark anyway. This jacket is really, really dark. So that's probably good enough. Let's just start painting with it. Oh, it's gonna do the collar. Well, okay, well, I'm doing this now. <laughs> Oops. This is not my final layer either. I am just building these these up. I love when I see lots of color in darker areas. A good example would be like the work of Sandro Botticelli. Um, famous for paintings like um, La Primavera where which are in the Uffizi gallery in Florence and what's amazing you know you wait in line for like three hours to get in like you're going to the Louvre and so you buy a guidebook and you're looking at the guidebook at these very famous paintings and the guidebooks are photographed with lots of color with lots with the lights on and you probably do a little bit of Photoshop afterwards to brighten them up and then you get into the museum and you stand in front of those paintings and they're really dark and they're all lit by natural light so um, you kind of like oh I, it looks better in the guidebook I can't I can hardly see it and it's done deliberately again it's like it rewards someone who's got more patience because you stand in front of it and as you're looking at it, things start coming out of the shadows. And it is so exciting. Because it's... Remember, we're talking at a time, like, back in the 1500s, before film and television, Netflix, right? And, you know, a painting was as close... Like, especially a you know, big painting was as close as you could get to, like, a big blockbuster Hollywood movie. And you would come and sit in front of that painting and look at it for hours and um, so there wasn't this urgency to to see it all at once and then to move on and go see something else your your plan is to kind of spend time with the painting and let it kind of unfold in front of you You know what? That is pretty close, actually, to the final color that I do want there. I was planning on painting a black layer on top of this. We'll see. As it dries, I think I might, I still might do a bit of black. But this gets very close to the purple 
that we at the very least see, let's say, on some of the lighter parts of the jacket. So it's got kind of this very dark brownish purple. And the reason why it's a little bit brown is because we've got that warm yellow, the imprimatura underneath all of that. And when we paint that yellow underneath a purple, then, you know, purple is blue and red. And we have yellow. What does that create? Now we got a brown, right? So it's not, it doesn't surprise me we got a brown there at all. I like that we've got kind of a brownish purple in that space. In fact, we could just paint that same color here, but I think I want to just do something a little bit different, make make it just a bit more visible, perhaps. Oh, my studio is getting cold. I'm just thinking how I want to approach his shirt here. I think we want, we can take our warm red. Now, this, this is obviously way, way too bright, so we want to darken that down. I am thinking about using a bit of cool red in here as well. What makes sense? Like, we could just, again, paint that purple on top of this, which is going to give me a different result. In fact, let's just see. You know, if we were to... Well, hmm. Um, let me see. In fact, maybe not just quite like that. Let's let's take our warm red. We're going to do this. Let's do this here. Take our warm red. I'm going to take my warm blue and mix this in here. Yeah, that's... That's probably... That'll be nice because it's going to be just different enough. I wonder if I want to make it... Let's take a bit more warm blue. The more that we put in there, the darker and darker it's going to get, obviously. I just like this... Uh, was, should I put any cool red in there? Let's put a bit of cool red in there. I'm just going to give it just a little bit more of a crimson quality. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Okay, let's paint this over here. Now, we might lose some of our pencil marks.
Yeah, I think it needs to maybe go a little bit darker still. It does look brighter on camera than I'm sure it is in person for sure, but. Okay, I wonder, do I want to start glazing a little bit? Let's, let's do a bit of glazing, yeah, okay. So, um, I'm going to take my satin glazing fluid and some black. So I'm going to take this black and some of my um, the original color. Let's mix these together to make a darker color still. And then let's mix this into the glazing fluid. The glazing fluid is going to thin it out. this kind of handy so that I can refer to it.
Now, obviously, he's got this chain necklace, but I think I'll do that one of my final things we'll, we'll do. Um, you can see that, you know, as I've done this, I've kind of departed a little bit from that. It's kind of changed a little bit. That's okay. Or maybe it's easier to see that on camera there. This has got a little bit longer. I could lengthen or shorten that. I mean, it's, I, it's hard to really know if that's exactly the way it looked. Um, I think I'm just, I'll keep it like that. Do I need to, do they need to be even? Uh, maybe let's make it a little bit more even. making sure that lines up you know as it disappears in behind here Awesome. Yabluko Vid Yabluni says, I want to say thank you for the work you do. I'm still going through your 40 lessons for beginners, and I'm incredibly lucky to have come across your channel. Thanks again. And Paula says, Yabluko, where are you from? And says, hi there, I'm from Ukraine. Um, awesome. That makes me so excited. As you may or may not know, my... Um, my ancestry is Ukrainian as well, so uh, obviously I feel deep connection to um, uh, Ukrainians all over the world and great Ukrainians like Nikolai Gogol as well, uh, which is one of the reasons why I chose today's uh, painting. Um, so yeah, that makes me super excited that fellow Ukrainians potentially, I don't know if sure if you're actually in Ukraine, but uh, that um, if you are, um, wishing you the best and you and your family and that uh, hopefully this horrible war will be over soon um i have no no doubt that ukraine is going to come out on top here it could take a little bit of time but history will will prove us victorious i'm sure okay so uh let's do a little bit more of this here and just kind of I mean, right now, like, this looks maybe... It's it's definitely brighter on camera than it is in person. This is going to be... You know, this is right now very subtle. I can keep on going and keep darkening and darkening and darkening. Uh, I think what I'll do... Is I'm going to do one more layer of the dark area underneath here.
And then we can use the same color to kind of shape it a little bit to give maybe a few little wrinkles on the scarf. All right, so now this red now kind of starts to approach the purple that's around it. Now it's actually actually a little bit darker than the, the purple that's around it, and that's fine. We're gonna go do the same thing to the jacket. Yeah, how much more of this do I want to do? I mean, that's sort of like a question artists are always asking themselves. How much more is necessary for us to get it? So one thing too with when we're using this glazing fluid because it kind of slows down the drying time one thing that can happen is like what's happening here is if i keep noodling around in here rather than applying paint i start wiping paint off and i start having these like it's like a you know it's like a an itch if you keep itching it it just peels away that top layer of skin and then we got this like little wound there so let's uh So Yabluku says, and by the way, in my hometown, there was a monument to Gogol right in front of my school. That is so cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure in Ukraine, there's many monuments to this great, uh, this great author. And um, he's so far ahead of his time, as we talked about earlier, in terms of, I think like any time you're watching, like if you watch you know, Netflix after this, and you watch Stranger Things. Stranger Things wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for this fellow, right? Um, because he really paved the way for a particular kind of humor and um, storytelling. So just darkening underneath that collar there. I think that's good enough for right now. Lucas says, and thank you very much. The Ukrainians really appreciate your support. Well, um, that makes me so excited. Yeah. I think one of the things, you know, considering what's going on right now, I think it's important to remind people of that Ukraine has a distinct culture different than anywhere else in the world with great artists, musicians, authors, and... Um, that Ukraine isn't just some, um, you know, province of Russia. 
Um, which, by the way, and, and I think it's also important to remember, you know, it's I, for Ukrainians, it's English speaking Ukrainians, it's important to not say the Ukraine. When you the Ukraine is a, is a is something Russians invented to refer to Ukraine as the Ukraine is like in Canada saying the prairies or the Arctic, and it's a way of saying basically like a area of Russia. And Ukraine is not in a part of Russia or an area or a province of Russia. It's a, a distinct country and culture. Um, so that's why it's, I'm so glad to hear more and more people saying Ukraine or the country of Ukraine, not the Ukraine, right? That's, that's definitely when I hear that, ugh, it drives me crazy, right? Because, and so you, it's, I'm glad to hear less and less people saying the Ukraine and just saying Ukraine as a country, like in the same way you wouldn't say the Canada or the France, right? Okay, well, I want to, let's do this jacket now. So we'll do the same sort of thing we've been doing here. Let's take our uh, cool red and warm blue, mix that together. And now let's take some black, mix that black into here. Now we've got a really dark black again. Maybe even more black. And then let's take our glazing fluid and mix this into here. The, the glazing fluid allows us to do any blending if we want to kind of smooth out edges. Sometimes you see me just using my fingers for this. Now I'm just going back over everything because I think I'm going to darken even more with some black eventually here. Now I don't know how it looks on camera. It does look temporarily lighter, and that's just because it's wet paint and it's a little bit shiny. That, that's that's good it's now a little it's definitely darker now it makes me think well maybe some of this needs to get darker too and that's okay i think when, what we'll do probably is just let this dry while it's drying let's move on to the face and hair and then we can come back but i am very happy with how all that looks down below because you know the original 
is very, very dark. I mean, it's darker and darker still than everything we have here. Ibluko says, for now I'm in England, but my family is staying in Ukraine, and hopefully I'll be able to go home soon. Cheers to that, for sure. I, too, look forward to the day being able to visit Ukraine. I wanted to, I would love to go there now, but I've got a three-year-old daughter here. It, it seems a little bit silly for me to to go there. I, I, I have talked to some of my contacts in the Department of Defense, because I was an official Canadian war artist for years, um, about going there. Obviously, Canada doesn't have any official presence in Ukraine right now. But um, uh, there are there's training of soldiers in in Poland in Estonia. So there is potentially the opportunity to go there and do a little bit of um, document because I'd like to go there and, and paint some of the, um, the the brave Ukrainians who are training. I just love those colors. I love that purple. It's, you know, it's almost totally black. You know, it's basically like what we see in the picture, but it's got this just gorgeous glowing purple. And that's what the, this is why building layers of paint is so much, I think just far superior to than just painting one layer of paint. Because we could have just mixed this purple and just painted it there, but you know, we've done a few layers of purple. We had the yellow imprimatur to start, and then we also kind of had like kind of a brownish purple. So there's four layers of paint there. And I know some people are like, this is just a waste of time. I don't know how it looks on camera to you at home, but in person, now this has the effect of like, it. it's almost like an oxymoron in that it's really dark and yet it's glowing. It's, there's like a life force inside this dark jacket that is just glowing. I don't know how to describe it. And that's one of those things that you see in great paintings and museums. I'm not saying my painting is a great painting deserved to be in a museum. I'm just saying I'm using that same technique that we see where, you know, it's there's energy in those dark spaces. So, yeah, I get excited about this stuff. <laughs> Okay, I do want to do a little bit more work here, but I think let's come back. I got to do the necklace and all that stuff later on, and I'm probably going to even darken a few areas even more with some black, but we'll see. So I'm just going to blow dry all that so I don't smudge any.
I just, I, you know, tomorrow is the birthday of Gogol, and I just was like, let's, 1809, so, um, I just want to see, I love doing, using this, uh, let's see, let's see eight. 1809. So tomorrow will be the 214th birthday of Nikolai Gogol. So, um, just something to note. 214 years ago, Gogol was born. Okay. <laughs> So, oh, that just, I love how this looks. I, I don't know what, I mean, it probably just looks like a big black blob on camera, but wow, that just glows. That's so cool. Um, you know, I, I wish I knew how to do some of this stuff a long time ago. Um, man, this is, most of the stuff that we're talking about and I'm teaching is stuff that I did not learn in art school that I learned after art school um, doing lots and lots of research and lots and lots of failing and practicing. Um, and, you know, it's all, it's, I don't have any regrets, but, you know, it's one of these things that, um, it's just, it's bizarre what is, and I teach at a university at, at one of the best art schools in Canada, and, and there's not really a, a lot of people that teach any of the stuff we're talking about, including myself, because I don't teach these classes, but. Okay, let's let's work on the face now. We haven't uh, we kind of skipped by that a while ago, or well, we got that first layer of paint. So let's uh, we're gonna mix some more of it, just making sure I get enough paint here. Let's do let's do this again. Let's take our our um, warm yellow, a bit of warm red, not too much. Let's start out slow. We can always add more to it. And a little bit of warm blue. I mean, when I say a little bit, I'm not kidding around, right? Mix that in here. The warm blue is what makes a brown get darker and darker. Okay. Let's mix this down here. We could see maybe a little bit more... Oh, that's that, now that's turned into a blush. And then let's take I like having lots of different little mixtures of paint to use. Awesome. Let's start out. Um, well, I, let's let's take a look at the painting here. Some people would prefer to go to the darker areas first. Maybe I will do a, take more of my blue. Let's mix this in here. Let's take more red. Okay. 
So now, let's take our glazing fluid. So I'm going to use that color. I'm just going to take some of that excess paint off here, right? And then let's bring that back. Um, I should also say I want to have a blending brush nearby, something that I can blend that paint out with. I'm pretty. I'm starting out pretty subtle. I was, as I said many times, I find like glazing fluid is is the perfect um, material for a timid painter, and so it's always easier to start out a little bit lighter, and then to build up as we go. I mean, this is the way the Mona Lisa is painted, right? Just very thin layers of paint, building and building and building, taking your time. I'm just I just added a bit more brown into my glazing fluid just to speed up this process a bit. Okay, looks a little funny right now, that's okay. Yabluku uh, says, I have a silly question about painting on canvas. What to do in case of a mistake? Is it possible to somehow remove a layer of paint and try to redraw? Or is it better just to start a new one? Um, well, if you're painting with acrylic paint, you can um, you can try to scrape it off. You could try it. Some people will sand it off using like a power sander. Like if it's still wet, you can maybe get a rag and some water and really scrub at it. But once it's dry, it's going to be pretty adhered to. You know, it's probably easier to just paint some white paint over top of anything and hide it. Um, some people, some people, you know, you reuse the same canvas over and over and over, which is why you get these things where, you know, they, they, you know, uh, x-ray a painting and they see, oh my goodness, look at all the stuff. That's on. There's two 
paintings hidden underneath there. Um, uh, so it's, it really depends how you feel. It, some people pr would just prefer to, to start anew um, rather than try to you know, paint over an old painting. Depends on how much money you've spent on the canvas. If it's a kind of a cheap canvas, probably just easier just to start a whole new one and set that one aside. And maybe you'll think differently about that painting and be, be like, actually, it's not so bad. I'm glad I didn't paint over it. So, um, well, so many different philosophies when it comes to painting. And, um, you see, I'm leaving a little bit of a lighter edge. There's a little bit of a reflection that he's got of lighter area on his head there. A little bit of paint, a little speck of paint there. It's... Wipe that away. You, know, you can see he's got a pretty pointy, narrow nose, right? Um, so we're just kind of enforcing that here. Okay, so maybe it's worth now putting a little bit of um, red in his lips. So let's take some warm red, some glazing fluid.
Uh, it might be worth just taking a quick little detour here and looking at um, this uh, article that the great painter James Gurney did. We've done an episode devoted to James Gurney, um, and I think he's he's also he's alive today. He's a YouTuber himself. Um, he did a whole series of books that was turned into a TV show called Dinotopia, um, and it was really one of the great painters, illustrators of our time. Uh, certainly find his um, YouTube page, check him out. He does these outdoor uh, paintings, and you can see him using his approach to painting. But what I just really want to kind of show us here is is he talks about like dividing the face into these three zones. He's not the first person to talk about this or, or do this, as he shows here. But you kind of want a bit more yellow on the forehead, red on the cheeks and nose, and then a little bit more of this bluey green gray on the chin. And so he uses shows you a few examples. Here's a portrait, uh, Gilbert Stewart's um, portrait of uh, George Washington. We could see that little bit kind of uh, yellow, red, you know, gray, yellow, red, and it's you know, gray is kind of hidden in here. But even this girl here, it's her hair top of is kind of covered, but we got so we have still this. Uh, red and then bluish gray down below. So um, that link is in the uh, in the uh, in the description below. That's what I'm trying to get to. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm just gonna, now going to add a little bit of rouge and red into the central area of the face, and then we'll come back as we get the highlights. We'll put some yellow up above. Oops. So I've got my warm red. I'm just gonna maybe put even more glazing fluid in here. very subtle so far. Okay, let's blow dry that. So I'm sure that this is probably very subtle and is not quite coming through completely on camera, and that's okay. Do maybe one more layer of this rouge on his cheeks here. I 
Notice I'm also painting a little bit further down below as well, so. And now I'm going to take this lighter color, which has got more yellow in it. And white. And I'm going to paint with this as a highlight. reflection on the bottom of his chin from his shirt. I'm also just going to actually take this color and go a little bit on those eyes and just get rid of a bit of that white. It was pretty intense. Okay, let's blow dry that.
Maybe let's do just a bit more. I was going to move on to the darker areas, but I just... Let's get a little bit more of a highlight here. So another thing that I'm doing as I'm painting, I'm doing a little bit of squinting. I'm looking at mine and the original, and that allows me just to see the contrast, the areas of light and dark. In this case, I'm looking for the lighter colors. Let's make um, a gray. Let's take our black. Uh, let's take this is glazing fluid right here. So let's take that. Um, and I'm just going to take a little bit of, of uh, cool blue. Mix. Oops, sorry. You can't see what I'm doing here. So there's my, I took my black from I made earlier, and I took a bit of cool blue, mix this in here. I didn't even really wash my brush because I want a little bit of that yellow that we have on here. Like if I take, let's just take a bit more of this. Uh, the important, because we want a bit of that, the white and the yellow gives it just a bit of a gray blue gray there we go that's the color we're looking for let's put more oh that's too much glazing for it let's just that to the side so like this color on its own is sort of like ooh. But it's going to serve a really useful purpose to darken some parts of this picture. In fact, I'm just going to wipe that excess off. Because sometimes what happens is there's the actual original color is pretty dense, hidden inside the bristles. Okay.
you know, I'm, I'm looking at this on camera, like on camera, it's not, I'm not super happy with the way it looks, but that's okay. It looks a little bit different on my side. That's cool. It's coming together. Okay. Let's just keep on going here. let that dry so what I did is I started wiping paint away so it's that's the frustrating thing about glazing fluid is if you kind of go too far and you just keep on touching it up then it literally wipes away paint so let's gonna blow dry that and stuff Have to be careful. He's getting a little jolly here. Um, he's got a bit of a double chin that I've created for him, but that'll disappear shortly. Again, I'm going to take that gray go over the white of his eyes and darken that down. Okay. 
Okay. So I'm still there's still lots more to do here, but I think what I want to do next is uh, let's do a little bit of outlining, and I think we'll get back some of the the facial features which may feel like we've we've lost. Um, maybe. Well, let's. Um, I'm just looking at the original. It is a bit of a purple, a deep purple. So I'm going to take my purple and my black and mix these guys together. There's also a bit of purple right in the in his eyes. I'm actually let's do that. I'm gonna take some my purple and some white. Almost got kind of like purple eyes.
this mustache now. Just to keep on going here, we're going to blow dry shortly again. Okay, I think I'm going to now just go right to my black. Let's take some black. I'll put it down here just so I can take advantage of a little bit of glazing fluid to make it a little bit thinner and easier to paint with.
So I just added a bit more, bit of brown into my black here. here bringing back his jaw Thank you. 
Paula asks, my, my, Michael, are there any mouse in your house? There is, and funny you just mentioned it. Out of the, just as after I read your comment, I look over here and I see a mouse run across the floor here, which drives me crazy. I spent $700 on Orkin to come and solve this problem, and they're still here. So, can't say I recommend Orkin very much, considering I spent all that money, and I probably could have done just as well with $20 worth of traps from... Home Depot or something. He's starting to, to put on some weight, this fellow here. This is this is the uh, Las Vegas um, Nikolai Gogol, you know, where he's kind of putting on some weight. You know, the he doesn't have to work so hard anymore. That's okay. Well, he looks kind of rotund right now. Well, as we go here, we'll thin him out. But I just think it's kind of funny when these things kind of happen. It's That's funny that he looks a little bit heavier. That really cracks me up. I like where this is going. I like it's slowly getting darker and darker. I do want to just um, uh, thin his thin him out a little bit. He's gotten a little bit uh, uh, heavier in the in the jaw. So let's take our lighter color up here. Let's see if we can.
Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm using my, my warm red and glazing fluid here. Computer fell asleep there. <laughs> So you can see that's a product of me being impatient and trying to fix it too quickly. And now I gotta kinda build it back up slowly.
Okay. I'm going to put a little bit of a highlight. Just take some pure white right out of the middle. Let's put a bit of a highlight. Uh, I got one. Right there. Can you just with some white. Let's see. Mm, a little bit too much. Okay, let's uh, maybe transition for a few minutes to a few other things. Paul says, beautiful, don't try to make it, it comes alive. Don't try to make it, it comes alive. <laughs> uh, let's, I'm going to shape this face a bit more. So let's take our black. I'm just going to use my glazing fluid again here.
Okay, so I got a little bit of paint there. So I can just be kind of quick about it. Get a little bit of water on a rag. And quickly wipe that. You don't want to be, you got to be careful about doing too much, otherwise you, you end up wiping paint away that you don't want to wipe away. But uh, We haven't really talked about that hair much, so let's, um, let's take this, our black, and maybe we need to mix brown again, uh, let's see. Uh, we got a bit of brown. Let's just make a bit more of it. So warm yellow, warm red, warm blue. Let's put more blue in here to make it a much darker brown. And let's take our black. I'm gonna mix black in right here. Notice I'm not mixing it into the whole mixture. I want to preserve a little bit in case I need a bit of it. And now we got a very dark, dark, dark brown, almost black. Okay. <clears throat> and again, I'm gonna add a little, oh, I got glazing fluid. You know, I'm gonna take this glazing fluid here. Scoop that into here. Let's... Okay. Now, lots of different ways of painting hair. I'm going to try to do this as relatively quickly as possible. Um, and what I'll do is, is sort of paint some lines. In here. And it's not nearly as dark as I want. Okay, so let's just add more black. So this is just the way that I like to do it. I like to kind of paint a, a kind of a some of these lines to help shape the hair. I'm gonna go to my outline that I drew. Just show you kind of like you know, that's the lines that I see when I'm drawing it.
And let's go back to the... You can see I'm sort of, every time I go back into my palette, i just sort of mixing different browns. So we'll blow dry that. It's interesting how much lighter it appears on camera. This is pretty dark to the point where, you know, I can see these lines, but they're very subtle. On camera, I'm like, wow, I can see each individual line. It looks like a fingerprint, you know? So it's um, just, it's uh, like, I feel like I could probably walk away right now and feel happy. And I look at the, at the screen, I'm like, whoa, that needs a lot more work. So it's, um, just have to remind myself that it looks different in person than it does on camera. I'm going to take my black now, this brown, uh, let's get some of this glazing fluid on there. And I'm going to try to start kind of darkening over top.
So I'm going to blow dry that again. Taking more of this, my black. Do a little bit more with my black. Well, it's not it's not even actual black. It's still that brown, but it's just a, a very dark brown. And I've added glazing fluid to. Okay. Um, now quickly, just, I'm going to go the opposite direction here. So I'm going to take some glazing fluid, go into my, sorry, my brown. I didn't quite get the shape of his hair all the way, you know, properly done here, but I'm just doing kind of quick and dirty version.
you know, again, on camera, it's a little bolder than it actually is, but I kind of, I don't mind that so much like that. Being very subtle, I think, can't hurt. I want to go back into my red here. Take my warm red, glazing fluid, maybe even a bit of a slightly darker color. going to dab off some of that extra and do that again because it was a little bit watery. You know what? I'm just going to wipe that off. I felt like there was some water from the water jar that uh, didn't want to run out. Adding a bit of this red in and around the eyes. Uh, we've been kind of backed in for a while. And it's looking pretty good. do a little more glazing with my black. Darkening everything here.
Um, I'm going to take a bit of my purple. Take a tad bit of white. I'm going to glaze with that. Right, just going over here with a little bit lighter purple. So now I'm just taking actual black. Let's uh, blow dry this.
So now we just want to do some finishing touches. Really, I think the chain is the main thing I want to do. I might go back over with a little bit of purple and outline a few things, but we're pretty close. Um, I'm happy with the face and the hair. I mean, I could do more and more and more, but I think good enough for government work, as my grandfather used to say. So... Um, Let's, uh, in fact, maybe I'll take this dark purple. Cool. This is great. I'm happy with this. Okay. Just want to do that chain now. Let's, I'm just going to quickly blow dry this. Okay, so this necklace, you know, it's interesting, there's no, we don't, there's like not a pendant or anything at the very bottom, it just sort of ends right down there, so how do we want to... I could use the the template and transfer it again, or I could just sketch this out. You can see I'm also using the natural uh, range of my wrist to do this line. You know, the... the, the... Okay. And what color should we use? Hmm. It's like a... Let's do a warm yellow. 
and white. Let's just do this right here. Let's take our cool yellow since we got... Oh, that's going to be too much. Let's take some warm red. Now we got a peach. Not the color I was looking for. That's okay. What I want to do is I'm going to take that color. Let's bring it over to our black. And where should we do? Let's do this right here. So that I'm going to make a kind of a gray. And then we'll use that other color as a highlight. So I'm, I did this with my pencil, and so it's only really visible from a couple of angles here. One thing I, I do every once in a while is I just take that brush and just pinch it and pull it out to try to keep it as pointy as possible. I mean, that might be enough. I was planning on putting a little highlights on their reflections, which probably still will, but I mean, potentially this is as dark as it might appear on the palette. Once you start painting, you're like, oh, it's pretty, that's definitely much lighter than, than anything else in the vicinity. So it really pops.
and let's just see it all zoom back out. You can see how that looks. I mean, yeah, it's not bad like that. I did, though, want to just put a couple of brighter highlights on here. Maybe let's zoom in. So it's like this gold chain has just a few, you know, it's catching the light in a few places. And it gives it that little sparkle, a little reflection. Let's put a bit of white in there too. The white will, otherwise that warm yellow might not be strong enough to, to show up. So this is now our kind of most bright highlight. So we're only gonna put a few, actually no, sorry, this is not in focus. There we go. It's driving me nuts. Huh. 
Okay, that might be good enough. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Okay. Um... Uh, well, there's a lot. Look at all these comments I just missed. Um, oh, Paul has some suggestions on how to catch the mice. Uh, Paula says, Have you tried to sell your paintings, Michael? This afternoon I went for an art walk. A flower painting in oil sold for over $1,000. Uh, yeah, I've, I've sold uh, some art work in the past for um, a little bit more than that, for sure. <laughs> Um, uh, there's been many times in my life where I've, I've lived off the sale of my paintings for sure. Yeah. Um, Paul says, Michael, can we use a white pastel pencil? Uh, yes, you could for sure. Go right ahead. Yeah. I mean, the only thing to think about is that pastel pencil could smudge potentially, you know, if it, so, um, Whereas the acrylic paint, assuming it doesn't get wet, is not going to smudge, right? A pastel, um, even an oil pastel, can smudge a little bit. So you just, you may want to then varnish the canvas, put some sort of spray so that it doesn't, it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't smudge. Oh, Kathy tuned in. Uh... This looks amazing. Great job, Michael. Thanks. Um. <laughs> cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's do our side by side comparison here and just check out how these paintings did. Um, as a you know, great favor to myself, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if you want to know when future videos are happening, hit the notification bell so you know when they happen. Um, it's also super helpful if you comment on previous videos. I know Kathy's been great at that. Uh, speaking of Kathy, um, has gone back and made comments on a bunch of older videos. That is awesome. Kathy, I love you for doing that. Thank you so much. Anybody else watching right now, go back and leave a comment on your favorite episode. Well, maybe today's your favorite episode, but ones that have happened in the past, that would be great. Um, it just helps... You know, if a video has a few comments on it, people are more likely to watch it because they think, oh, well, people really enjoyed this one. Maybe I'll check it out. Um, as well, if you want to leave a small donation, you can use t donate 25 cents, a dollar, five dollars through PayPal. Um, Super Chat functions works well in YouTube, but YouTube takes like 40% of your donation. So if you want to make sure I get the most of any money you're trying to donate to me, and to the show, consider using an e-transfer. That's I'll, I'll get like 95% of whatever you donate. Uh, my email is in the description below, or sorry, it's on my website. And uh, so go to my website, you can find it there. I don't put it here because otherwise I would just get bombarded by crazy spam. <laughs> I already get enough of it, but uh, you can also contact me through the Facebook group. And the Facebook group, um, you can send an email and I can pass along any details that way. Okay, okay. Let's um, see these side by side, and you tell me what you think. Um, okay. So I'm pretty happy with the way this turned out. You know, as I, s I look here, I could probably have, you know, is is. I could have gone darker on his face, long story short. Um, right now, it's a little bit bright. It would have made more sense to continue glazing and darkening, but you know, I think it's probably enough for tonight. I've been paint, I've been teaching painting since 8 this morning, so it's now 8 at night, and I've been on my feet all day. I'm looking forward to sitting down. <laughs> um, what else here? I think everything turned out pretty good. There's some weird reflections on this painting, like down here where there's actually not... Is that... I don't think that's paint. That's just a reflection. Um, this is also darker... Or, sorry, lighter than the original. That, those 
uh, that collar. I don't mind it like that. Um, yeah, let's have a let's zoom in on a few places and just take a look. Um, I'm going to go up to the top here and just look at the background for a moment, if you'll indulge me. So, um, obviously I, I took a little bit of a different tact uh, to do the, the, the background than the original. I was just wanting to kind of get that done as quickly as possible. Um, and I think it turned out pretty good. There was, you remember there was some inconsistencies in there and I, I got rid of those in my second background pass. So that makes me really happy. You know, there's, it's a little, it's tiny bit uneven there. And that's just, if I really wanted, I could go back and do glazes and really get super precise, but is that a problem? I don't know. Let's go down and let's go to the very bottom, maybe to the bottom right. We're looking at his jacket here, overcoat, and yeah, I mean, that is even, you know, more obvious than his. You know, he was even more subtle. Moeller was. Um, let's go the other side just to... So I could have kept that even more subtle, but I, I think it's okay. I could potentially also do a little bit of a white highlight along the edge of the jacket there. I'm almost wondering... If, ah, I'm not just going to leave it. But um, the reason why is there... You know, if the light is hitting it, it's probably going to lighten that. In fact, maybe... Let's just do a tiny bit of it. Because the light is kind of coming from the left, I think. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do just a little bit here. Ay, ay, ay. a little bit I think is good um, yeah I, I probably could continue glazing and darkening that I don't mind how it looks now but you know it's just something to, that I could be even more subtle about it and then let's let's go look at the face in a little bit more closer here Um, happy with the way the hair turned out. Um, I, you know, I, I probably could have darkened in here and made his jaw just a little bit less round, a little bit more pointy, because he is kind of a thin guy, right? Um, but I think this is okay. And now I'm looking at this and I see that his eyebrows, that this really should come up a bit but i think i'm going to just walk away right should i oh, i don't i don't know it's one of those things that i might have to well let me see
Okay, I better I better stop, otherwise I'm just going to be here all night long. Um, so just a couple little things here, just to kind of just chisel his chin in just a little bit. I kind of just fixed that little area, of because we want these to be parallel, both of those, uh, the bridge of his nose there, right? And I, you know, potentially I could even carve that in, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to. Let's zoom out. I mean, my guy, 
Um, he, just that little bit of, of paint there makes him look like his mouth is open, like he's just about to say something, which I don't mind. He also looks kind of happy and cheerful. He's like, he's kind of smiling a little bit. Um, versus the one on the left, his mouth is clearly closed, but also kind of smiling. So they're both kind of happy fellows, which is a little bit funny considering who um, Gogol was. You know, his his work is, is very darkly humorous, right? I encourage you to, to, to go to your local library take out a copy of Gogol's stories. His short stories are fantastic. As I said, The Overcoat, Diary of a Madman, excellent, perfect short stories. Take it half an hour to read the two of them together. Um, and you would have a great introduction to really one of the greatest authors of all time, primarily known for his short stories. Um, and you'll be surprised how much you will, you'll laugh out loud at the, the absurdity of a book written nearly 200 years ago. Um, uh, you know, one of the great authors of in human history happens to be a Ukrainian. Claimed by Russia as well, because he did write stories in Russian, but he was born in Ukraine and wrote a lot of stories about Ukrainian history, Ukrainian culture, and did spend... Um, really the last half of his life in St. Petersburg in Russia. Um, uh, and I just think that it does... One of the reasons why I also thought today's episode would be kind of good is just a, a reminder that in the past, Ukrainians and Russians have got along. There hasn't always been war amongst um, our peoples, and we look forward to the day when... This horrible, ugly war is over. There's a lot of... The vast majority of Ukrainian people... Or Russian people, I would say, are wonderful, incredible people. Some of my favorite artists are Russian. Some of my favorite authors are Russian. Some of my favorite musicians and dancers are also Russian. And I look forward to the day when ideally I could go... I've never been to Russia. I, I've always wanted to go visit the Pushkin Museum... Um, the, the Hermitage Museum, some of the greatest artworks ever made are in Russia, and hopefully I'm not banned from ever going there, uh, because I think the I think the, the so many great things about Russia. So, um, Gogol, um, thank you so much for being the subject of today's painting. Thank you, Fyodor Morler, for making this portrait and many other great portraits by this artist, or of Gogol. Um, Thank you to you guys for tuning in, especially on this unusual, uh, on, we don't usually do these on a Sunday afternoon, so those of you who've been watching, thank you for watching. We'll see you guys on Tuesday. We are looking at Henrietta Shore, a, a fantastic, you're going to love, we're going to do a painting of a cat um, uh, on Tuesday. I'm looking forward to that. Thanks everyone, we will see you again very soon, have a wonderful night. Wherever you are on a beautiful planet, I love you all. Can't wait to see you again.